This conference will now be recorded. Welcome to this evening's program, When the Cavalry Came to Call. It's presented by Michelle Washington Wilson, who is a writer, performer, and storyteller from rural Newtonville, New Jersey. Michelle has been writing and telling stories for more than 30 years. She earned a bachelor's degree in speech and theater education in Monmouth, from Monmouth University in West Long, Long Branch, New Jersey. That's a little tongue twister for me. She has traveled through North America and the Caribbean sharing stories from around the world. Michelle is an active member of the New Jersey Storytelling Network and the National Association of Black Storytellers. I hope you enjoy this evening's program, When the Cavalry Came to Call. They came from the fields and the cabins, from the barns and the kitchens to gather on the front lawn. They came out of the big house and stood by the big hall. They gathered to learn of freedom that day when the cavalry came to call. Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Washington Wilson, and I am a professional storyteller from rural Newtonville, New Jersey, and now living in Atlantic City, New Jersey, which is a story all its own. But tonight I'm here to talk to you about Juneteenth, the federal holiday signed into law in 2021. I want to thank everyone at the Mercer County Library Systems, especially Miss Anna, for inviting me out to speak to you virtually this evening in celebration of what has been called Freedom Day or Emancipation Day and Juneteenth. Juneteenth is a blend of the words June and 19th because it was on June 19th, 1865 that people working as slaves in Texas finally got the word that we were free at last, free at last. The celebration started in Texas with church picnics and speeches and spread as black Texans moved elsewhere. Today, as a storyteller, I will share with you some stories, some poems, and even some historical documents about Juneteenth, events leading up to it, how it is celebrated, and what it means as we move forward as one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. A few months ago, I presented a program on Harriet Tubman at one of the branches of the Hamilton Township Library. And a woman came up to me after the program and she had several questions about slavery in the United States. Where did people go when slavery ended? What did people do? And questions that I usually answer in some of my other programs like my Harriet Tubman program, Tales from the Cape, about abolitionists and the Underground Railroad, or the program that I do called Food and the Folks of the Great Migration, which is about Black people after emancipation and relocation until the 1970s. Now, yes, that was a shameless plug. But I was wondering, as this woman was asking me these questions, well, where has she been? But I did detect a foreign accent. And I really don't remember where she told me she was from. I think she said Scotland, I don't know. But it made me remember that not all of us are native born to the United States. Not every family goes back eight generations like my family and actually have an ancestor who fought in the Civil War. And not everyone knows American history. The holiday has also been called Juneteenth Independence Day, Freedom Day, the second Independence Day, and Emancipation Day. While the official end of slavery 
should have come on January 1st, 1863, when President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, many Black Americans, especially those in states still under Confederate control, remained enslaved for many years after. The complete end of slavery actually came on June 19th, 1865, about two months after Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia at the end of the Civil War. On that date, Union General Gordon Granger and approximately 2,000 Union soldiers went to Galveston, Texas which had been under Confederate control to inform the more than 250,000 enslaved Black people that they were now free, per executive decree. Those in this group were the last remaining enslaved people in the United States. The master he gathered them together under a tree beside the Great Hall. It was the 19th day of June, 1865, when the cavalry came to call. As society grows great when old men plant trees under which they will never sit, this was a wonderful day for all the generations coming after it. And so, as I was visiting um, a, senior, a senior residence facility in um, Bridgewater, New Jersey called Laurel Circle, I met people there who embra embrace life with open arms and warm hearts. And one resident there, while I was presenting Harriet Tubman Tales from the Cape, said, wait here, I want to share with you a document written by one of my ancestors in Middleton, Connecticut in 1850. Now this was um, a Caucasian gentleman and he went and he got the document and he gave me a copy. And it reads as follows. The undersigned are friends of law. We reverence law. We are of the party of law and order. Law comes from the bosom of God and is sacred. Even an imperfect law we will respect and bear with till we can obtain its modification or repeal. But all is not law, which calls itself law. When iniquity frames itself into law, the sacredness of law is gone. When an enactment falsely calling itself a law is imposed upon us, which disgraces our country, which invades our conscience, which dishonors our religion, which is an outrage upon our sense of justice. We take our stand against the imposition. The fugitive slave law commands all good citizens to be slave catchers. Good citizens cannot be slave catchers any more than light can be darkness. You tell us the union will be endangered if we oppose this law. We reply that greater things than the union will be endangered if we submit to it. Conscious, humanity, self-respect are greater than the union, and these must be preserved at all hazards. This pretended law commands us to withhold food and raiment and shelter from the most needy. We cannot obey. It commands us to be base and dishonorable. We cannot obey. Turks refused 
to deliver up Hungarians? Shall Christians betray their own countrymen? When our sense of decency is clean, gone forever, that's when we will turn slave catchers. Till then, never. You tell us that great men made this law. If great men choose to disgrace themselves, choose to put off all manliness and plunge all over into meanness and dishonor, it does not follow that small men should do so too. If Beacon Street and Marshfield choose to turn into slave catchers, let them. We farmers and working men choose to stay by our plows and our mills. You tell us that great men in the church endorse and defend Marshfield. Well, be it so, but we tell you, we are not yet ready to give ourselves over to all manner of villainy be the consequence what it may. Come fines, come imprisonment, come what will. This thing which you call law, we will not obey. And it is signed, William Lyman, James T. Dickinson, David Lyman, Marvin Thomas, Russell Bailey, and Alfred Bailey. And so this thing called slavery was prevalent and laws like the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 mandated that everyone be part of returning slaves back to slave masters. But everyone evidently was not on board with that and let it be known that making slaves out of people was a major problem. It caused great debates, great fights, skirmishes, and eventually a war, a civil war, which the North was losing. The North was losing because men in the South could leave their farms and their businesses and go to war, leaving the Black people enslaved on their farms to carry on the work and the economy. Enslavement had ended in most Northern states. So when men in the North went to war, everything was falling apart. So Abraham Lincoln, the president, had to do something to preserve the union. Those of us who are familiar with American history are familiar with the Emancipation Proclamation issued on January 1st, 1863 by President Abraham Lincoln. The Emancipation Proclamation declared forever free more than three and a half million slaves in Confederate areas still in rebellion against the Union. It did not free almost 500,000 slaves in the border states loyal to the Union. Maryland, Kentucky, and in some areas, under union control, including the state of New Jersey. New Jersey still had 16 people enslaved in 1865. And those enslaved states, those living in slave states not in war with the union were freed by the 13th Amendment. Texas was part of the Confederacy, but news traveled slow in those days. I mean, everybody did not have T-Mobile. Everybody was not watching CNN. Everybody wasn't driving by. There were no cars. There were no televisions. There were no radios. There were no cell phones. So Texas was part of the Confederacy. 
and the news was traveling slow in those days. Not only that, but cotton was king, especially in Texas. And the slave owners knew that they needed somebody to pick that cotton in the fields. So they weren't in any great hurry to let people know that they had been made free. When General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas at the end of the American Civil War, two years after the original issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation, he read General Order Number 3 that said that slavery was over and all men and women and children formerly enslaved were free. I would imagine using my storyteller imagination that it was like any other day of slavery in the fields from day clean to day gone, trying to make it go faster by calling and responding in song. They sang, I got wings, you got wings, all God's children got wings. When I get to heaven, gonna put on my wings, I'm gonna fly all over God's heaven, heaven, heaven. Everybody talking about him man going there, fly all over God heaven. Well, up at the big house, the cook was preparing the meals, turning the biscuit dough over and over in her hands until it had just the right feel. The blacksmith was shoeing the horses as the coachman prepared for the ride. The coachman would be driving the master that day, a job that he did with pride. Everyone had their position and the work that they had to do, but everything changed in that moment that the cavalry came marching through. The master, he gathered them together under a tree beside the great hall. It was the 19th day of June, 1865, when the cavalry came to call. The general, he read off of a paper that said, we were henceforth free and all the future generations free. Yes, even down to me and many shed tears of joy, but others had trepidations of anxiety because they were not sure just what it meant. What does it mean to be free? So I stand today to speak of that day when the cavalry came to call. Now, Juneteenth is a day set aside to celebrate not just the good news of emancipation, but also a day to remember those who labored so long, those whose shoulders we stand upon. Countless people, we don't know their names, but we honor their legacy and the sacrifices they made. What did it mean? What did being free consist of? Billy Taylor said, I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. I wish I could break all the chains holding me. I wish I could say all the things that I should say. Say them loud, say them clear for the whole round world to hear. Now, today, as we celebrate Juneteenth, Emancipation Day, Freedom Day, we have cookouts and barbecues. It is not a day of service. It is not a day of sales. It is a day to reflect back and celebrate those who came before us, the survivors those who labored in the cotton fields, the tobacco fields, who unloaded ships on the docks, who shooed horses and built roadways and labored in the swamps, who rocked 
cradles and cooked for families while their own children went unfed and those who lost their lives enslaved, working till they dropped dead. To those who died escaping, trying to free themselves and those who died in defiance as fugitives on the trail. In this program this evening, I will connect some stories, some poems, sometimes seamlessly for the sake of continuity. I have some original works, some folk tales, and some poems such as The Colored Soldiers and When They Listed Colored Soldiers by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. If the muse were mine to tempt it, and my feeble voice were strong, if my tongue were trained to measures, I would sing a stirring song. I would sing a song heroic of those noble sons of Ham, of the gallant colored soldiers who fought for Uncle Sam. In the early days, you scorned them and with many a flip and flout said these battles are the white man's and the white man will fight them out. Up the hills you fought and faltered, in the valleys you strove and bled, while your ears still heard the thunder of the foe's advancing tread. Then distress fell on the nation and the flag was drooping low. Should the dust pollute your banner? No, the nation shouted, no. When war in savage triumph spread abroad its funeral pall, then you called the colored soldiers and they answered to your call. And like hounds unleashed and eager for the lifeblood of the prey, sprang they forth and bore them bravely in the thickest of the fray. And wherever the fight was hottest, where the bullets fastest fell, where they pressed unblanched and fearless at the very mouth of hell. Oh, they rallied to the standard to uphold it by their might. None were stronger in their labors, none were braver in the fight from the blazing breach of Wagner to the plains of Bolesti, they were foremost in the fight of the battle for the free. And at pillow, oh Lord have mercy on the deeds committed there and the souls of those poor victims sent to thee without a prayer. Let the fullness of thy pity or the hot wrought spirit sway of the gallant colored soldiers who fell fighting on that day. Yes, so blacks enjoyed their freedom and they won it dearly too for the lifeblood of their thousands did the Southern fields bedew in the darkness of their bondage, in the depths of slavery's night, their muskets flashed the dawning and they fought their way to light. They were comrades then and brothers. Are they more or less today? They were good to stop a bullet and to front the fearful fray. They were citizens and soldiers when rebellion raised its head 
and the traits that made them worthy. Ah, oh, those virtues are not dead. They have shared your mighty vigils. They have shared your daily toil and their blood with yours commingling has enriched the Southern soil. They have slept and marched and suffered neath the same dark skies as you. They have met as fierce a foeman and have been as brave and true. And their deeds shall find a record in the registry of fame, for their blood has cleansed completely every blot of slavery shame. So all honor and all glory to those noble sons of Ham, the gallant colored soul fought for Uncle Sam. They was talking in the cabin and they was talking in the hall. But I listened kind of careless, not a thinking about it all. And on Sunday too, I noticed they was whispering mighty much standing all around the roadside when they let us out of church. But I didn't think about it till the middle of the week when my liars come to see me. And somehow they couldn't speak. And then I seed all in a minute what he'd come to see me for. They had enlisted colored soldiers and my liars was gone the wall. Oh, I hugged him and I kissed him and I, I begged him not to go. But he told me that his conscience, it was, it was calling to him so, so he couldn't bear to linger when he had a chance to fight for the freedom they had given him and the glory of the right. So he kissed me. And he left me when I promised to be true. And they put a knapsack on him and a coat all colored blue. So I give him Pap's old Bible from the bottom of the draw. And when they listed colored soldiers, my liars went to wall. But I thought of all the dreary miles that he would have to tramp, and I couldn't be contented when they took him off the camp. While my heart, it nigh broke with grieving till I seed him on the street. And then I felt like I could go and throw myself at his feet for his buttons was a shining and his face was shining too and he looked so strong and mighty in his coat of soldier blue and i hollered step up manny though my throat was sore and raw when they enlisted colored soldiers and my lies went to war. Oh, miss, she cried when master left her and young miss mourned her brother Ned. And I didn't know their feelings is the very words they said. But I told them I was sorry they had given up their all, but they only seemed more prouder that they men had heed the call. Both my masters went in gray suits and I loved the Yankee blue. But I thought that I could sorrow for the losing of them too. But I couldn't, for I didn't know the half of what I saw till they listed colored soldiers. And my lies went to war. 
Massa Jack, he come home all sickly. They said he was broke for life, they said. And they left my poor young Massa somewhere on the roadside, dead. And when they women cried and mourned them, I could feel it through and through, for I had a loved one fighting in the way of danger too. And then they told me that they had laid him somewhere somewhere way down south to rest with the flag that he had fought for shining there across his breast. Well, I cried, but then I reckon that's what God had called him for when they listed colored soldiers and my liars went to war. when they enlisted colored soldiers, a poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. As I mentioned in the beginning, Juneteenth was a holiday which began in Texas and spread as people from Texas migrated North and West. Now, and when I was a child, my family did not celebrate Juneteenth we celebrated watch night. Now, before you get excited, now you are not getting another paid holiday because watch night is connected to a day that is already a holiday. Watch night goes back to December 31st, 1862, New Year's Eve. The word had already spread to the free and the formerly enslaved African Americans across the North in cities like Boston and Philadelphia, they had already heard that President Abraham Lincoln would sign the Amansa Proclamation and it would go into effect on January 1st, 1863 marking the beginning of the end of more than two centuries of American slavery. Black folks in the North gathered together at churches and homes in solidarity with those held in bondage in the South as they awaited the news of freedom. They watched all night long as the hands of the clock moved towards the hour of freedom. And then freedom came to some, but not those in border states like Maryland and Kentucky and not to those in Texas. We still celebrate watch night at our church And just like Juneteenth, we celebrate with traditional foods like black eyed peas for prosperity. And you gotta have collard greens so you'll have money all year and pound cake like we carried with us during the great migration. And that's what I make gumbo. Mm. I honor my New Orleans traditions, making gumbo with all the animals, everything that swim, fly, or crawl goes in the gumbo. It is a day like Juneteenth when we gather at one another's homes and we sing the old songs, co-mingling our voices. We dance and the old people tell us stories. They tell us stories of the old days, what it was like having faith and having courage is part of the African American tradition. When Ernest J. Gaines wrote his book, The Autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman, it was a historical fictional account about the life of a woman who was six years of age 
a child on a plantation in Texas on June 19, 1865, when the cavalry came to call. The character of the book, Miss Jane, lives to be over 100 years old, and the story captures the turbulent and triumphant times of African Americans following of the emancipation and on into the civil rights movement. The fictional account, which was based on the aunties and elderly neighbors of Ernest J. Gaines, ends with Miss Jane voting and taking a sip a cool drink of water from a fountain marked white only. Many of the people of those years coming out of slavery were functionally illiterate, never having been taught to read or write. They really couldn't even read their Bibles, although some had passages so well memorized that people would say, Oh, they couldn't read anything but their Bible. But actually, they weren't reading. They were reciting. There was no way that they could thumb through the book and read, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. They couldn't find written confirmation. So they depended on a vision, a vision with the story of their faith and their courage and their ability to go on. The story that I would like to share with you comes from the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman by Ernest J. Gaines. We ain't had no church back then. The peoples used to hold service in an open field down the road from where the church is now. Me and my friend Grace, we would sit out on the porch in the evening and listen to the singing and the praying. Well, one day, Grace said, Jane, I believe I'm a join up with the church. I said, well, you a right nice person. Can't nobody say you don't belong up there. She said, Jane, why don't you come on and join with me? Well, it was a lot of people seeking their true religion back then. Me, Tommy, Lobo. And it seemed like everybody was coming through. Everybody was finding their true religion, except in me. I said, Grace, you, you reckon I just ain't fit for glory? But she told me, don't talk fool talk. She said, you keep on fasting, you keep on praying, and one day you too will go in. Well, I fasted. And I prayed. I prayed so that I could barely keep my eyes open when I would go out to the cane field in the morning. But then, early one Thursday morning, I was on my way to the cane field when it seemed like a heavy load just fell back off my shoulder. I said, Grace, I believe I got it, Grace. She said, do it make you feel light? It always makes you feel kind of light. I said, Lord, y'all feel like I can fly. She said, well, that's it. She said, you go on home and you prepare yourself. And tonight you will have a vision to tell the congregation. And that night, I told my story. It seemed like, it seemed like I was standing in an open field and I had a heavy load on my back and it was weighing me down and, and weighing me down. And, and, and when I looked up, 
a man had appeared before me and he had on a long white robe and his hair was like cockleburrs and his feet shone like brass. And he said, Jane, do you wish to be rid of that heavy load? And I said, yes, sir, but how do you come to know me? You must be the Lord. And he ain't answered me. Just said to be rid of that heavy load and be rid of it always, I had to carry it across yonder's river. And sure enough, where he pointed, a river sprang into view. And when I turned around to ask him, how he did such things? He was gone. And I started on down towards that river with that heavy load on my back. And it seemed like it was heavier than the weight of death. And as I walked, briars and, and thorns and old sticker bushes began to spring up in front of me where they had not been before, but I kept on going with that heavy load. And I stepped my feet down in that old murky water. And it seemed like snakes, hundreds and hundreds of old water moccasins began to swim towards me where they had not been before, but I kept on going with that heavy load on my back. And the water come up around my knees. And when I looked up, there was my boy Ned. And he said, Mama, give me the sack. And I said, Ned, that's that's really you? That's that's really you, Ned? I said, I I can't believe it's really you, Ned. I I think it's just the devil trying to fool Poje. Now, Ned, if it's really you, you tell me what it was that you carried in your pockets all the many years ago when your real mama died. And I could see the face of Satan straining and straining, trying to remember what it was that Ned had carried, but he couldn't remember. That's how I knew it wasn't my boy. He'd have never forgot them two flits that his real mama gave him so we'd be able to keep on making fire. And when I refused to give him that heavy load on the third time, he too disappeared down below the surface of the water and I kept on going with that heavy load. And when I looked up again, there was Joe Pittman. And he wasn't old like me. He was still young as the day he died. And he said, Jane, ma chérie, give me the sack. And I told him, Joe, I, the man back there on yonder's riverbank told me this was a heavy load that I had to carry forth for myself. And when I refused to give it to him on the third time, he too disappeared down below the surface of the water. And I kept on going with that heavy load. And it was weighing me down and, and weighing me down. And when I looked up again, there was Mr. Albert Clavio, that old Cajun man. And he was sitting on that horse that had drugged Joe Pittman to death. And he was holding that gun that he used to shoot my boy Ned. And he said, Miss Jane, you give me that sack. 
And when I refused to give it to him on the third time, he raised that gun to shoot. And just as he pulled back on that trigger, I stepped my feet on solid ground. And the Savior was there to meet me. And I wanted to fall down on my knees. But he said, rise up, my child. He said, you've been born again. And I wrote. And I felt good and free and light. And that night, I told my story to the congregation. And I sang my song. I sang, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Yes, our faith and our courage has been a part of our history. From the time we came here enslaved on ships until this very day, when we celebrate Freedom Day, Emancipation, the day that the cavalry came to call. <coughs> Excuse me. We celebrate how we can soar like eagles and not live like chickens. You know, with every celebration, as the sun goes down, the people begin to tell stories. And somebody always wants to hear the story about the eagle who thought he was a chicken. You see, it was a farmer who had his farm underneath a great tree high up on a mountain. And one day the farmer decided to go up on that mountain and he saw in the great tree a big nest. And he said, oh, it's an eagle's nest. And he looked over in that nest and he saw two eggs. Now the eagle wasn't around, so the farmer took those two eggs and he said, I'll take them back to my farm and I'll put them up underneath my setting hens and they'll hatch these eggs and I will have something that people will want to see and I can charge money and I can make me some money off these eagles. Well, he took the eggs home and he put them up underneath his hidden hands. And sure enough, one day the eggs began to crack. Well, the chicken, she had several eggs in that nest. And the first one was a cute little chick. And it peep, 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 peep. And it cracked through the egg and the mother hen said, oh, you're so cute. I'm going to name you Pete Pete because that's the first words we said. And then another egg began to crack. Pete Pete, Pete Pete. And a, another little chick popped out and he was just such a little cutie pie. She said, I'm going to name you cutie pie because you're so cute. And then one of those big eggs began to crack. Cheep, cheep 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 and this big bird broke out with a big pointy beak and the mother hen looked at him kind of strange but he was her baby so she said i love you too and she said you know you seem kind of shy so i'm gonna name you shy chicken and then the other egg cheep 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 began to crack open and another big beak came out and the mother hen looked at that and she said, ooh, another one. And then she said, well, I'm going to name him after the fryer. I'm going to name him Fry Chicken. Now, be careful what you name your children, okay? Because their name could become their destiny. I'm just saying. 
So now she had her little brood of chickens and she took them out into the barnyard and she started teaching them how to be good chickens and how to dig and scratch in the dirt for worms. And they went to chicken school and they did chicken scratch and they learned how to do the chicken dance and everything was going pretty well. But then, you know, shy chicken, he, 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 he noticed that these worms just weren't doing it for him. He started looking at those mice running around in the barn. They started looking mighty delicious. And he said to his brother, you know, I, I'm getting bored with this diet of worms and, and this stuff that the farmer's wife throws at us. And his brother, Fried Chicken, said, well, I don't have any problem with it. I, I like standing by the door waiting for the farmer's wife to throw me some food. Matter of fact, I'm going to go over there and see what she's throwing out today. So Shy Chicken, he went for a walk down by the pond and he looked down into the water of the pond and he saw a large brown bird. And as he got closer and he pecked at it, he noticed, oh, this must be me. It must be my reflection. And so he went back and he told his brother, fry, fry chicken, listen, listen, listen. I went down by the duck pond, I looked in the water, I saw my reflection, and, 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 and I'm brown. And fried chicken said, yeah, no, I know, I, I could have told you that, but I, I didn't want to hurt your feelings. And he said, yeah, but guess what? You're brown too. And fried chicken said, oh, no, 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 I'm not brown. I am white. I am a white chicken. I eat worms like a chicken. I can do chicken scratch. And when the barnyard starts to play, when the fiddler starts, I'm the first one doing the chicken dance. So he said, I am a white chicken. I was born a white chicken and that's what I'm going to be. I'm gonna stay right down here and be a chicken. So Shy Chicken, he was thinking about this thing and he looked up and he saw this great bird circling over the barnyard and the bird came down and it landed on a branch and it said what are you doing down here with all these chickens and shy said well I, i'm i'm a chicken and the bird said no you're not you're an eagle and he said no i'm not i'm a chicken and this went back and forth back and forth and so finally the, the great bird said listen you are an eagle I'm an eagle, you are an eagle. I'm not sure how you got down here in the barnyard, but you are an eagle, you are not a chicken. He said, and not only that, but you can fly. Fly, yes. Shai said, well, I, I, can, I can hop up on the branch. He said, oh no, no, you can fly. He said, flap those big, beautiful wings that you have. And so Shy began to flap those wings and he took off to the sky. And the great bird, the great eagle said, follow me. And they flew and they flew and they saw a mountain. And Shy said, oh no, uh, there's a mountain ahead. We're gonna crash into it. We're gonna die. And the great eagle said, oh no, no, no. That's, that's just a, a mountain of oppression. He said, you can go over that mountain of oppression. You can fly. And so they flew. And then they saw a great lake. And Shy Chicken said, oh no, we're gonna fall into the lake. We're gonna drown. And the great eagle said, oh no, that is a lake of indifference. If you do not become indifferent, you can fly. And so they flew. And next they came to a desert. And, and the little eagle said, oh no, surely we're gonna perish in this desert. And the great eagle said, oh no, that is a desert of discrimination. He said, just rise above it. Just continue to fly. Keep your focus, keep your head to the sky and you can overcome 
despair, indifference, oppression, and discrimination. And so they flew higher and higher until they flew on to where the chilly winds don't blow. Thank you. It's been my honor and my privilege to be with you. I want to thank our friends again at Mercer County Library Systems, especially Miss Anna, who also is a great technical host. And so I'm going to um, turn the program over to Miss Anna at Mercer County Library 